Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today would typically be the mayor, the governor himself, Mr. Michael Becker, but he is on a family vacation and could not join us. Yeah, I say the governor because we are in the great state of Texas. We're down in Austin today. So sitting in the podcast is Hans Box. Hans, how are you? Hey, Paul. How are you doing? Doing well. As you know, Hans is with Old Capital. He covers Austin and San Antonio. Uh, in parts of uh, Houston for Old Capital. So we are down in the capital of Texas. So we wanted to have Hans come in and, and spend some time with us. Yeah, Paul, thanks for having me on. And so what's going on in the Old Capital world up in DFW? Well, we appreciate you asking that question, Hans. So October 24th and 25th in the DFW Dallas area, we have the 2019 Old Capital Multifamily Conference that uh, we want to invite you to. Again, the Old Capital Multifamily Conference is our annual conference. At the, now it's going to be at the House of Blues this year. It was at uh, AT&T Stadium where the Dallas Cowboys played last year. And we always have great speakers for that. Last year we had Roger Stahlback. The year before we had Rob O'Neill, who had happened to shoot and kill Osama Bin Laden. And Roger Stahlback, Captain Comeback, uh, U.S. Naval Academy, known for a number of Super Bowl rings. But the best thing he's known for in Texas is real estate. And so he was the um, real estate guy to DFW for a long period of time. So he was a realtor on the commercial side when he was also playing football. So we had him last year. So this year we have a super, super speaker, but I won't tell you who it is until the end of July. So go on to the oldcapitalpodcast.com, oldcapitalpodcast.com and reserve your ticket to come see us. So come on. Coming down in Dallas, the October 24th, 25th, all-day conference. And the biggest thing down there is networking and meeting other people that are in the business, around the business, whether you are a general partner, lead investor, looking for equity. A lot of uh, people come there. If you're a limited partner looking for opportunities throughout the United States, this is the place to go. So we appreciate uh, everyone coming down to see us. We're going to have about 750 people there so. We're looking forward to that. In the podcast today, we have some friends of ours that we've known for a long period of time. In fact, uh, Bruce, how long have you and I known each other? Uh, 2011, I believe. You actually did my first loan. So 2011, we got to know Bruce at that period of time. And you've done a number of transactions so far. And we've just recently just closed another one for Bruce. And so in the podcast today, our friends Bruce Peterson and Stephanie Peterson, partners in multifamily. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, their background, how they came into multifamily, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, and just get to know them a little bit better because Bruce operates a lot of properties in the Austin area. So if you are you know, throughout the country looking for an opportunity for Austin, maybe you want to get to know Bruce and Stephanie a little bit. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to Hans and let's get going on some of these questions. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for Great in intro. So guys, just wanted to kind of start out this podcast kind of talking about your history and how you got started in multifamily itself. And maybe each of you take an in, uh, individual and kind of give me your quick story so everyone can get a feel for how you guys started out. All right, I guess I'll start. So 2011, 2010, actually, I retired. I was 43 years old. I was a retail guy, right? I worked in retail for 18 years after, you know, flaming out in the stock market as a stockbroker. In my early 20s, when we went to uh, Desert Storm, it all dried up. And for a 23-year-old kid not knowing how to save any of his money, he was going hungry. So I fell into retail because I'm a college dropout too. So I didn't have a whole lot of options open to me. But I did that for 18 years. I, the last year, I worked like 100 to 110 hour weeks. And it was, it was absolutely destroying me. I had enough money saved up because I was, used to was, a Dave Ramsey guy, right? Not so much anymore because I realize... He's not necessarily for me anymore, but he got me kind of where I needed to be, I guess. You know, I had plenty of savings, so I walked away. I had kind of quasi-retired at 43, realized I got 50 more years of life to live with nothing to do. I had no wife, no kids, no dog, nothing. So I just did a Google search for somebody to teach me how to invest in real estate. Bought my first property in 2012, 
with the help of Old Capital. I mean, it's been off and running since. How big was that first property? Did you dive into the big property first, or did you start out with a smaller deal? First deal was a 48-unit property in North Austin. Brought in 14 investors with me. Back in the days when Austin, you could buy things for 30s. A door, I bought for $34,000 a door. Sold almost two and a half years later, actually, for a 300% return. So yeah, first thing I ever did was a syndication. Well, a lot of happy uh, investors in that one. It's hard not to be happy when you make that kind of money. <laughs> And I bet you wish you still owned it. In no, Austin. not at all. No, not at all. We did the right thing. We turned it into, <laughs> I turned that one deal into two additional deals. So yep. the investment from the first deal turned into three total deals. Wow. So no, I'm extremely happy. Yeah. You're able to roll that and, and continue adding to your syndication. So Stephanie, kind of, can you give us a quick story as well and, and how you got into real estate and, and, and how you've partnered up with your husband and business partner? Yeah. So my mom sold real estate my whole life and I had rental properties in Austin since 2000. I went back to school and got my master's in accounting and I worked for a national firm and we did audit and tax returns for apartment complexes. And Bruce and I actually met at a meetup for real estate. So you got some education through Bruce or did you have to go out and get educated on multifamily through another educational mentoring group. How did you understand about what was going on in multifamily? So when we first met, we had, um, in a syndication, you have to reach out first. The investor has to make the first contact. And so I sent him an email and said, I'm really interested in investing with you. And then I sent him another email that said, it was really great meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Bruce married one of his investors. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it was. And I actually got scolded because shortly after that, I replied to her email and said, hey, uh, would you like to do dinner some night? And I got scolded. You're not allowed to ask me out in an email. Or a text. Or a text. You must ask me in person. I'm like, oops. Or okay. on the phone. <laughs> well, we're still here, so it worked out. He called me immediately. <laughs> I had money to invest, and I wanted to learn as much as I could. And so I would say, okay, this is not a date. This is a business meeting. And so I would take my notes, and I would quiz him. We did that a lot in the beginning. And I was going to buy something on my own, and it wasn't working out. And I ended up investing in that one with some other friends. And they had a big flood. It was down in San Marcos. And I was really happy when they were going through all the flood issues that sure. I didn't own it at that time because I, I really wasn't ready. So tell, tell me a little bit about your single family business. I think how many single family properties did you own and did you manage those yourself? Yes, I did manage those. I had a condo that I turned into a duplex. I did a 1031 exchange on that. And that duplex got me through my divorce and grad school. And I would take my kids over and it was a section eight property. It was built to be section eight. And it started because I read something in the paper that said the city of Austin was paying rent for section eight tenants. And I thought, well, I'm never going to be the person that's receiving that. But if I own the property, then I'll get the rent. And city of Austin is more than likely going to pay me on time right? more so than the tenant. So I started looking for properties that were specifically section eight at the time. So tell me a little bit about, so we've gone from single family, you've got educated a little bit about multifamily business. And now how many units do you guys own currently right now? Total 940. 940. Wow. And that includes the one you just closed. That includes the one we just closed. We've syndicated a total of a little over 1,100, but currently we own 940 as syndicators. Okay. So you've sold what, two or three deals? Two deals. Okay. Okay. Good deal. And so how do you guys typically raise your equity and, and how many investors do you have typically in these deals, just on average? So friends and family, right? For those of you that know what I'm talking about, we do 506B offerings usually. We've done one 506C in our past. And what does that mean? Okay. So 506B means that I can bring in sophisticated, but non-accredited as well as accredited investors, but I'm limited to the number of non-accredited investors 
to 35 by the SEC regulations that I can bring into a deal. I can't advertise. I can't market. I cannot solicit in any way, shape, or form. Now, 506C is kind of the opposite, that I can only have accredited investors now, but because they are all accredited, I'm allowed to advertise anywhere in any way I choose. It's a totally different thing. They don't have to be friends and family. On a 506B, they're typically going to be friends and family, people that you have a pre-existing relationship with to get into a deal. So those are usually what we do on the 506B. You know, we've we've been engaged in this industry, I guess you'd say, at the Central Texas, well, actually at the Texas level for, you know, go back to 2011. So we have a very extensive database of people that we have gotten to know over the years that have expressed an interest in investing with us. So they're smaller investors in the grand scheme of commercial real estate. We usually have a fifty dollars to $100,000 minimum investment level. The deal that we just closed, we have 70 to 80 investors in that one. The smallest I've done, we've done, is uh, 14 investors in the very first property. And we did a two-property portfolio in 2017 consisting of 484 units. And that one we had 99 investors in with a $100,000 minimum. Talk a little bit about, I mean, you have a longer track record than most people have that have just gotten into the business. But if you're a if you're just getting into the business, what is your advice to some of these people that have gone through the friends and family and they haven't filled that bucket up with enough money? Any advice how to go out there and shake hands and kiss babies and to get people to invest in your deal? What do you do? So I'll give you some real advice here because it's, it's, it's what it was for me. I'm not a networker by nature. I'm just not. Once you get to know me or if I'm comfortable in my surroundings... I'm in the mix. I'm in the middle of everything. I've got to be, you know, making sure I'm bouncing around everywhere. But before that, I freeze up in a room where I don't know people. Sure. So what worked for me, I just kept shoving myself into situations that people just randomly would come up and talk to me and it just kind of built from there. But now what I do, right, I'll own up to this. Now that I'm married to an outgoing social butterfly, I just follow her around the room. Yeah. That's exactly what I do. So for those of you listening that are what I'm explaining in my personality type, attach yourself to somebody that will walk you around a room. I can't just go make small talk with people I don't know. I can't do it. I freeze. Yeah. And if there's a room of nothing but those people, this is terrible, but I'll walk out a lot of times because I'm so ill at ease. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what it is. You just got to get out there and go to everything you can find to go to. Go to your conference, right, every year. Also, go to all the meetups you can find locally that are, you know, people trying to do what you're trying to do. Right. Be in, as engaged as you can and find any outlet where you can go meet people. That's what it's all about. We talked about this real briefly about, you know, you guys have come together and been married for six, five and a half five, years. Five and a half, six years. I remember when Bruce gave you, was it a ring? In front he, of a bunch of people. Yeah, he proposed in front of a room full of people. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, he was asking for money. In- <laughs> I'm a smart dude. I, maybe. So, <laughs> but, you know, if Bruce and Stephanie were the same, you, you have one person that's probably not necessary. So Stephanie has a skill set. And I agree with Bruce is that if you talk with Stephanie, she's engaging. She goes out there. She wants to shake people's hands. People understand when they talk with her that she's a quality person high level, knows the business, and has that accounting background too. So it kind of runs the numbers. So let's kind of talk a little bit about uh, what do you do, Bruce, and what do you do, Stephanie, as when you get into a transaction? What jobs are, are your jobs? It took us a little while to figure out what our jobs were. Yeah, because you do this full time. This is all we do. Right. When we first started, I still had a CPA firm. And so... It was mostly Bruce doing things, and then this is much more lucrative than my CPA firm was and took a lot less time. And so I transitioned out of that, doing this full time. And Bruce has managed people and run businesses his whole life. I was a stay-at-home mom for a really long time, and then when I worked in the accounting, that's not a people job. Sure. <laughs> and so... When I was initially put in charge of all the employees, uh, that wasn't going so well. Yeah. And when we found our lane, <laughs> I said, you're going to be in charge of the employees. I'm going to take over the books again. And now I do all the design when we go in and we 
remodel and do everything for the office and well, you rebrand the, the property you're, you're the ones you're i'm the, the one, one that's responsible for that and i think it's good to point out that bruce and stephanie self-manage they don't use a third-party management company so those guys have their own third-party management a separate entity where they house all their employees and that's what Correct. she's re- referring to in terms of their employees right so i do all the accounting i chose the software i do that part of it i'm overseeing bookkeeper and the operating manager and I'm communicating with the CPAs and doing that part of it. And then I'm investor relations on the backside. So whenever you find a property and then you get it under contract and then you're starting to raise money, the launch of the opportunity to the investors is such an important thing. And it sounds like you're the, the lead person in launching and making sure that, that the investor puts the money into your deal correctly. Right. So Bruce sends out the initial, hey, this is what we've got, and then they contact me. That's right. And I keep track of all the paperwork and make sure everything gets uh, is, comes in the door. Right. That is super critical because when people are going to invest $100,000 with you, they want to make sure that that money has been entered in correctly and the paperwork has been done completely and that the investor is an important person in the syndication itself and that you, know, you want to build – right from the beginning, a feeling of we're competent not only to take your money, but also handle this transaction right. too. So I can't think that that's, you know, putting your big toe in the bathtub is that you want to make sure that that investor who puts $100,000 trusts you to do it, that you do spend time to make sure that person's comfortable. You talked a little bit about software. Tell me a little bit about the software you use. So we use Resmin. And I why, and why Resmin? Why Resmin? I loved Resmin the first time I opened it up. And how do you spell Resmin? R E S M A N. For context, we came from point two before Resmin. Okay. Resmin is super easy. All of our staff really like to use it. They're able to contact support directly if they have an issue and they have been phenomenal. The transition, I've heard horror stories with other people trying to transition with new software and the transition's been very easy. It's super intuitive. I'm QuickBooks Pro Advisor, done QuickBooks forever. Sure. And so to me, it it lines up well with that. It's it's just easy and everybody enjoys it and it has all the reports and everything that we need. Are you guys able to scale with it with that software? Absolutely. We talk all the time about who's on our team, and I've become really good friends with my salesperson from Resmin. Sure. And she talks about the larger, much larger companies that are using Resmin. Good deal. So you just mentioned team. So where do you find most employees that you hire now? When, obviously, there is a, a decent amount of turnover in this industry, at least on, on the property level. And so where do you guys typically go for, for finding employees, especially in this tight labor market? All right. So- we're very, very, very interwoven in the local apartment scene, if you will. We're very active members in the local apartment association, the Texas Apartment Association, and the National Apartment Association. And so you, you network with lots of people. The regional manager we recently hired, we got from one of the really, really, really big national management companies because I took my certified apartment manager course with him in 2011. So, you know, it's just being engrossed in the industry, going to all the trade shows, all the trade organizations. My wife, Stephanie, is actually, I'll toot her horn here a little bit. She is the VP at at large large with the Austin Apartment Association. She's an alternate on the Texas Apartment Association's board of directors. Actually, I'm voting this year. Voting members. So (laughs) So that's how a lot of it has worked. And a lot of the people that we've met through those avenues are super well connected in this industry. So I don't want to make it sound like it's easy to find quality help. It's not at all. But we have done a lot of work, a lot of legwork to try to ensure that we're very, very well connected. And it's helped a lot. And how do you find managers and how do you find maintenance people? It's that. You know, it's it's how interwoven we are in this industry and the current employees that we have, they're connected. Once you get into this industry, you usually stay in this industry as an employee because they love the industry. It's a fun industry. And a lot of people bounce around from company to company vendors a lot of times. So a lot of property employees will actually go to the vendor side and works up for some of the vendors. 
then they will also bounce back into property management. So they're just moving around all the time because the average, honestly, the average multifamily property changes hands every two to four years in this industry. So there's so much moving around in this industry. So again, they just get to know everybody around them. And and that's how we do most of it. And you guys have been able to retain a lot of your your folks that have come with you on this journey. And we're going to talk about a little bit about this new, new property that you're that you just closed on. Tell me a little bit about, you know, did you have to go out and hire new folks? And how did that go? So we want to bring people on board from the existing property anytime we can, because you know, the saying is they know where all the dead bodies are, right? right? So we don't have to learn where all the clean outs for plumbing are, you know, where all these things are that it's going to take us some time to find. So we try to hire, especially the maintenance guys, because again, they know where all the skeletons are. But we also believe to our core in providing upward mobility and chances for promotion for our people. So on the property we just closed on, we promoted one of our um, assistant managers at a 300-unit property, kind of close to this 200-unit property we just closed on. She had been in the assistant manager role for a while, and she's just an absolute rock star. She was ready. So we're always trying to promote from within, always trying to develop our people Because I think that's huge in recruitment. Because if they know, if I come to work for you, you know, a relatively smaller company, we've only got 1,100 units or 940 right now, but we've done 1,100. You know, but you're getting in kind of on the ground level that we're in rapid expansion mode. And so they see this ability to rise with us. We've, We've promoted two or three different leasing professionals. This is the second assistant manager we've promoted. So we like to promote from within when we can, but often we will also try to retain some of the existing employees. Before we uh, transition to your current deal, and we'll, we'll cover that in a second, I uh, had one more question about self-management. You know, a lot of our listeners are either new to the industry or own one or two deals and may use third party because sometimes these agency loans require it. So when did you decide to get into self-management? Did you third party manage on your first deal? And kind of what are the pluses and minuses that our listeners at a high level should know about self-management? So in my first deal, 48 unit, no experience, no track record. I had no job, right? So the bank was willing to take a chance on me, but they were never going to let me run my own thing. You know, they they don't know who I am, really. They see me on a piece of paper. They were comfortable enough to lend me the money, but they insisted on third-party management for me. And I was upfront with my third-party management because my loan docs did not specify how long I had to have them on staff or had to have them employed for me. So I sat with the owner of the company before I took over my first property. I said, look, all cards on the table. As soon as I can get an office built on site, because we didn't have one on that 48 unit property, and I feel comfortable in what I'm doing, I'm going to let you go. He goes, hey, no worries at all. So I was totally upfront and professional with that man at the beginning, let him know what was going on. So six months in, we had our office built and we let him go. And I've self-managed ever since. You know, there's benefits to both. Third party managing. So having somebody else manage for you, for a lot of people, they do it because they're more nimble right? They can get a property, turn it over to a property management company and immediately go looking for the next deal. On the flip side, you know, it's that whole maxim. Nobody's going to care about my property like me, right? And I love, love everything about owning businesses, developing employees, setting culture, watching people grow and thrive. So I do not ever want to give that up. It's not just being a control freak because I am anything but a control freak. I believe firmly in empowering people around me and delegating. It, it's, it's what helps give us our quality of life, our balance of life. So we self-manage. We also third-party manage ourselves. You know, We manage for other owners. But to me, that's the most rewarding part. If I don't self-manage, I don't get a lot of the feel-good parts of this, right? Then it's only about dollars because it's, now it's just an investment. And that's not why we do this. You know, We do this to be able to make an impact in people's lives. As cheesy as that probably sounds, it's true. I can impact a lot of people's lives if I am the management company. So I, I won't change it. Great. Well, that sounds like a really good reason to be self-managed. So let's transition to your current deal and, and kind of give me an overview of, you know, how did you find this particular deal in San Antonio? And how many deals did you look at before you were able to get this deal under contract? Well, honestly, you know, you'll hear some people say 20, 30, 40, 100 properties. It it never takes me underwriting 100 or 200 properties to find one. I've never, ever had that happen. I probably did underwrite 
10 to 20 though, actually. And I toured probably about five to eight until I found this one. Why it, do you think that is? Sorry to interrupt, but why do you think that is that some people will take, they have to underwrite hundred, 200 deals to get one and you're able to do 20. Are, are you more sure of your parameters? Do you know what you're looking for and you jump when it, when you see it? it it's basically the latter, right? So I am not afraid to move. I know I'm a smart guy. I'm a college dropout, but I'm a lifelong learner. I'm a smart dude. I'll figure it out. The people that struggle and have to, you know, underwrite one, two, three hundred. Now, this is not a blanket statement. Not everybody fits this, but it's very common, right? I've taught people how to do what I do for years. I've mentored people for years and I see it all the time. You have an A personality and a B personality. You have an engineer's kind of brain, and then you have more of an entrepreneurial brain. The engineer's brain. We tend to pull a lot of those people into this industry because they understand spreadsheets. They get it. It's very black and white for them, but they don't think about all the gray that does exist. But what happens if you're an engineer, you're trained to have a contingency for any and everything that can pop up. You can never have that done in multifamily or real estate investing, period. Single family, commercial, whatever. So they get themselves locked up. It has to be the perfect deal. I'm okay hitting lots of singles. Every once in a while, those singles will turn into doubles, triples, or my first deal, an absolute grand slam. So I think I'm more willing to buy a property that doesn't check every single box without any exceptions because I know if and when I do face some adversity, I know how to get through it. We've gotten through adversity the whole way, and and I'm not worried about that, but a lot of people, they can't get there. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is basically take action, but measured action. That's what you, that's what you're doing. Exactly. I'm in no way reckless because I know I have a lot of people's money on my shoulders. So I have to be very, very, very careful. And I'm a fiduciary for these people. So I have to be careful. Go back to that first transaction that, that we financed for you because you brought something up that I forgot that you took a manager unit off that uh, someone was using the, one of the units as a, as a leasing office and you built Right or no? So what it was? You built, so, a, you built the structure, right? So I built, yeah, I did build a structure, but I bought this property from a lady out in California. She was in her nineties. She was ready to get out. This forty-eight unit property didn't have on-site management at all. So they had a property about a quarter mile down the street in North Austin that it was one hundred ninety-two units, and they ran both properties out of that one property. And they, and they weren't selling that one. This was just kind of a one-off deal. It was a you, one-off. They you, ended up selling the other one a year later because, like I said, she wanted out. She was yeah. she was advanced age, but yeah. So I bought that without an on-site management office. So we had to build a management office, a little ten by ten office. It wasn't anything special, but on a forty-eight unit, I just needed a place for somebody to sit comfortably and be the face of the property and police the property, so to speak, because there were lots of you know, undesirables in the neighborhood when we first took over. What did it cost you to build it? Do you remember? If I, I think it was sixteen five. Now, that was a long time ago, but I think that was it. We, you know, From the ground up, we had an existing uh, deck out by our pool that was 10 by 20. We split that right down the middle and carved off a 10 by 10 square and built a structure on top of it for sixteen seventeen thousand dollars and did somebody work there full time with the forty eight doors or was it somebody that would just come use that as a leasing office or so when someone would call in so when we first got it up and running, okay, I got to go out and hire somebody, so I was hiring part time because rule of thumb forty eight unit you yeah. can't afford full time staff right so I hired a part time manager, and you know like all part time people they say oh yeah, yeah I, I I'm just looking for part time Almost without exception, that's not true. They want full part-time because they can't find full-time. Once they find full-time, they leave you. They're gone. And she almost left me six to nine months in. She goes, Bruce, I love you. I love working for you. This is great. But, you know, I got to go find a full-time gig that has benefits and everything. I was like, okay, I'll tell you what. How about if? And I made her full-time because she was so good. I couldn't lose her. Right. Yeah, I absolutely couldn't lose her. So I believe in paying for good people. And that's exactly what we did. Great. So going back to your property that you, you just closed on, what, what did you like about the deal? What made you decide to move on this deal? And, and how did you get it under contract? Why, why did the seller pick you in this, in this hot market? Because I told the broker we wanted that one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that it's just a lot of sway. <laughs> so, I mean, she did. She honestly did tell him I that did. on a tour. So it was one property that they had for sale as a three-property portfolio, but they were willing to peel this one off and sell it one off if, if it came up. 
What I liked about it, it was 80s construction. I don't want anything in the 60s and not much in the 70s if I can help it because then you're dealing with lead paint, you're dealing with all asbestos maybe, you're dealing with lots of things I don't want to deal with. Individual water heaters, pitched roof, it was all the things that we typically look for. But the best part about it, it's on a lake, right? It's on a lake. So on one side of the property, it borders a lake. So about, I think it's four of the 10 buildings actually face the lake. On the other side of the property, there's a golf course. And then beside that golf course is a senior activity center. And then beside that is a senior living facility. So it's a really, really, really good, clean, quiet pocket. They haven't moved rents in at least probably 15 to 18 months. So I know I've got some opportunity there. They have done zero upgrades to this property. I honestly don't think since it was built in 1982, which is weird in this market that you buy an asset with no story of upgrades. And now I get to come in and just do the whole property if I choose, which I would never do the whole property. But, you know, that's the things that I liked about it. And, you know, I've got a fantastic working relationship with the broker because I'm a very, very, very low maintenance buyer. And that's important for people. Be a low maintenance buyer. Let the seller think that he got over on you. You win if you get that property. Don't get into pissing matches with people. It's just stupid. He's got the property you want to buy. She, he, whatever. You're trying to get that property from that person. You win if you get it from them. So I've been known and, you know, sellers out there probably go, hey, I want to contact Bruce. That's why I do it, right? That... I'm willing to leave prorations on the table. So what happens when you go to close? The day before you close, you figure out all the collected rent for the month. If I buy in the middle of the month, well, half the month that they just collected is due to me because we collect rents at the beginning of the month, not at the end of the month. Right. If they shortchange me $10,000, dollars 30000 well, okay, it's not right for them to do it. But at the same time, I'm buying a $20 million asset grand scheme of things. It does not matter at all. So why get into this pissing match, put a bad taste in their mouth? Yes, they got over on me. They shouldn't have, but you know what? It's not that important to me. Pick your battles and you need to ask yourself, is it really worth fighting this battle? Get your ego out of it. And so this broker knows I'm a super easy buyer. He'll bring me things. I wasn't the highest offer. I don't believe. I don't know that for sure. He'll never divulge that to me. But this is the second time I bought from him. And I know for a fact, the first time I bought from him, I was not the highest offer. But it's because he knows I will perform, I will close, but also it's going to be very seamless. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I know brokers like, like closers and brokers like people that are very easy to work with and people that don't kick tires. So exactly. I would like to tell new borrowers that all the time. Is this a long-term or a short-term hold for you guys? And what kind of loan did you get to kind of go along with your exit strategy? So the legal documents that come out will state five to seven years. And we readdress it every single year that we look at it every year, depending on where the market is. We may sell after a year or two when we plan to hold it for five or 10 years because the market dictates that uh, you might want to sell now before the values start to disappear. Or you might come up on year seven and you have got yourself in the middle of a, of a downturn, but you got a 12-year loan. Uh, guys, look, you know, to the partners. We may have to hold it a few more years than anticipated, but if we sell right now, this is not an opportune time to sell. So it's a fluid thing, but we go into every deal expecting a five to seven year hold. We syndicate, right? So we're bringing other people's money to the table. Most of the time when people are placing money, they expect it back at some point, right? So especially if it's a market that doesn't really support doing a cash out refi, I got to get their money back to them at some point. It's velocity of money. We want to turn that money for the investors. Now, if we bought by ourselves with no investors, yeah, a lot of these we would hold for 10, 20, 30 years because they're phenomenal properties. We've got them humming along, but we typically will sell. Our average has been about two to three years, but you know we'll usually sell in about five to seven as a uh, model. Again, just to put money back into the investor's hands. And very often that money just gets put back into our next deal anyway. So it's a, it's a great setup. What are people these days expecting for rates of return on their investments? It took a little while, but investors are finally coming around that look. The days of 10 and 15% cash on cash, those are kind of gone. I mean, you can find a pocket deal every once in a while that hits that, but it's so rare. I canvas people all the time. Anytime somebody comes into my system, you know, I have an intake interview with them. If I don't already know them already, sure. I got to build this relationship with them, make sure they're a good fit. 
So one of my first questions is, what's your expectation of return? And almost without exception, I'm hearing 6 to 8% by the end of the first year. So they're very realistic. I try to hit 7 or 8 myself. And our goals are to you know, return a profit at the end of the fifth year sale, because that's what I modeled just so I have something to figure out a return. An 80 to 90% profit, all in profit, when we sell in year five. If I can deliver an 80% profit and come in the front door at about a six to seven or 8% the first year, they're usually happy with that. Okay. So diving back into the, this actual transaction, I know you guys got an agency loan. Can you talk about what kind of loan you got and, and the process there? What was it like? Yeah, so we got a Freddie Mac loan. Uh, That's my first Freddie Mac loan. So there was a little bit of a learning process there, but everything worked out very, very well. They just gave us the best terms. We got an unbelievable deal from them. Uh, Fannie was was competitive, but they weren't quite as good as Freddie. So we decided to try Freddie for the first time. They're a little bit different to work with, but we got a 12-year loan. Well, we rate locked. When we did rate lock, I should say, we locked at 4.05% interest. That's incredible. That's the lowest interest rate I've had. And I got six years of interest only. So yeah. it was an amazing deal that I got from Freddie. Good job, Hans. Good job, Bruce and Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, good job, Hans. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, the Freddie loans are a little bit uh, different than dealing with Fannie Mae. Freddie has to approve every loan completely. They completely underwrite every deal. Unlike with Fannie Mae dust lenders, and many times the dust lenders can basically do the loan themselves, and they are approving it on behalf of Fannie Mae. But with Freddie Mac... Freddie Mac actually has to underwrite the deal. So you do have a lot more questions, typically from Freddie, and there's a little bit more paperwork, and it's maybe a little bit more annoying. But when you can get a 4.05 rate and six years I.O. and a 12-year term, 30-year AM, not a bad deal. Yeah, and just to clarify, that 4.05% interest rate, that was a sweetened interest rate, I guess you could call it, because we did implement the green program. So basically, if I'm willing to make some water and some electrical savings, uh, additions to the property, basically replacing aerators, toilets sometimes, shower heads, air conditioner units, things like that. If I'm willing to do that for the property, they will give me a 15 to 20 basis point improvement in my loan. So if we hadn't agreed to that, we probably would have come in at about 4.25 to 4.3, which is still fantastic. How much money did you have to spend to do you know, some of the stuff you were going to do anyway? Yep. But how much money were you going to have to spend on the green program to get that water conservation or energy conservation. $133,418, I think is exactly <laughs> the number. I'm a numbers guy, but it was roughly $135,000. But you're right. Even if we didn't qualify for the green program, they have parameters. They have to have an engineering firm come in to say, look, if they make these changes, it has to result in at least a 15 to 20% improvement in that utility cost, right? That expense. Even if the property doesn't qualify for a green program with the lender itself, I'm still going to do this stuff anyways, because why would I not replace toilets and cut my water bill by as much as 50%? I would always do that. But yeah, now I get a kicker of a better interest rate on top of it. So yeah, it's kind of a no-brainer. Any words of wisdom, Hans, to live by on a Freddie Mac loan or just this transaction itself? Well, words of wisdom are be prepared for paperwork, have all your ducks in a row, respond to emails quickly. Um, get information in. That's the key with most of these is in order to get, looks like we're going to get to close. Uh, we got to closing about 50 days after application, which is typical for a deal like this. And that's because Bruce and his team got all the information in. And, and on top of that, we had another wrinkle in this deal that we haven't mentioned. And Bruce did a 1031. And so not only is he getting his investors into a great deal, but he's actually saving them taxes from their prior deal. Correct. Yep. We sold 120 unit property in North Austin at the end of last year. And we had 180 days to place that money and we got it placed well within time. Uh, so that worked out really well. And at 1031, yeah, it, it's a great vehicle for building wealth, right? So, All right, Steph, the CPA, again, <laughs> explain to me what that means at 1031 that a lot of people don't understand. We take the funds from the sale and they're held by a moderator. Qualified intermediary. Yeah, Qualified <laughs> intermediary. Thank you. And from there, we have 45 days to locate three properties and 180 days to close. At that time, it's tax deferred until you sale. Okay. All right. So it's a way basically to shield profit from taxation temporarily. Again, you're just kicking the can down the road, but it's the same thing with, a, with an IRA or a 401k, right? It's going to grow tax deferred 
That's exactly what we're doing. We're growing wealth tax deferred, and then eventually we're going to have to pay taxes. But it's a way to to shield your profit on a sale. Yeah, until and, a later. And the date. beauty of it is, you shielded hundreds of thousands of dollars. It probably millions. At, yeah, millions. millions at a twenty five to thirty percent tax rate, and right. you're getting to make money on the money you shielded, which is wonderful. So it it just compounds so much quicker. And if you can pull that off on every deal, or even just once or twice, it, it it's a huge return built into the deal day one. Right. Exactly. So I'm sure that was a big selling point to a lot of your investors. Did did all of your investors roll over? No, or? about fifty percent of them about did, 50%. and that's kind of the, the attrition rate from what I hear now. I think some people have pulled off higher levels than that. But, you know, you'll have people that say, you know, I'm 85 years old. Eh, I'm, I'm done. You know, this, let me have my money and go. Fine. Um, other people have decided, like, as an example, I put $100,000 into this. And the profit, when I get my sale proceed check, I get a $150,000 check, right? So let's say you're sitting on $50,000 in profit. So a lot of people will say, okay, give me the $50,000 in profit and I'll reinvest the $100,000 basis into the next deal. So there's lots of iterations that happen with the investors, but on this one, we did hit right around 50%. Great, great. So, you know, kind of to wrap all this into a summary, and I had a few questions that I wanted to go through with you guys, kind of to, to understand what are the top three to five lessons that you guys have learned since your first deal, that 48 unit back in 2011, I believe? Till now, and you have over eleven. You've done over eleven hundred units worth yourself. What are the main lessons you'd want to tell a newbie getting into this business? I like building community. So for me, that's really big, and I think that's one of the main reasons that our residents stay. We have uh, higher occupancies, and we do a lot of things for our residents. The very first property that Bruce and I bought together, we had a lot of refugees on site, and the families were not getting along and I needed artwork for the office and I didn't have a budget for the artwork. And so I threw a Valentine's day party. We had canvases out all over. We invited people, the United way and refugee services of Texas and some other programs to come in and they helped to sponsor it for us. And then I did a Jackson Pollock style painting. And if you're not familiar with that, it's just splattered paint. So I bought all the colors that I wanted for the office and everybody got to come in and splatter paint. So nobody knows which splatter of yellow paint is theirs. And then we hung it up in the office. And to me, I was just getting free artwork. The kids got cupcakes and they had a scavenger hunt and the parents came around. The unintended consequence was that the kids started walking to school together, the parents started coming around, and Refugee Services of Texas used that model for other apartment complexes where they were placing families. So I'm always trying to look at what is the residential makeup, what's our demographic, what do they need, how can we serve them best, and always trying to build community. And that's how you're creating the value. Yes. Zach, how about, how about you, Bruce? What? The biggest thing from my, you know, colder side, right, that, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you about a school supply drive that we did, which was a lot of fun. It, <laughs> it, it's super, super impactful. It differentiated us. But me, when I'm putting deals together, raising the money for the deals and all that stuff, it's over raise, right? If you think that you need $300,000 in rehab, you better raise four or 500000 because something's going to pop up no matter how good a due diligence inspection you conducted. Something's going to you know jump up and surprise you. So that to me is probably the biggest thing, you know. And there's one other thing to keep in mind. I was talking to another syndicator one day years back, and this guy had done two, three, four deals, but on this next deal, he didn't understand the way Fannie Mae loans worked with regard to escrows. So he didn't realize that I'm going to escrow a hundred thousand dollars for Project X. But I also have to have that myself in my back pocket to finish that job and then go to Fannie Mae and get my money back. So you basically have to double fund it, right? He didn't know that. So he thought, oh, it's, I'm ready to go. Let's, you know, quote, unquote, break ground on this project. Here, give me my money. No. Go do the project. Submit the proof that you've done it. We'll send out an inspector very often. Once we know you've done it to our specifications, we'll return your escrowed money to you. It's another really, really, really important thing. So any money that you're going to escrow with your lender, you better make sure you have that much money in your own reserve account too. Stephanie, tell me about those school supplies. So as a single mom, 
I had kids in middle school at the same time, and I had that $130 algebra calculator, and it hurt when I had to pay for that. And so we took over this property. The Valentine's Day party had worked so well. And I thought, you know, these are all working families. We've gone in. We've made things better. The rents have gone up. Austin's happening to everybody. And so I wanted to do a school supply drive. And it's 120 units. How many kids can be on this property? 83. (laughs) There are 83. So we did backpacks and school supplies for all the kids. Both of our daughters and friends came in and helped pack up the bags and hand out pizza. We gave gift cards and a few supplies to the older kids. And we did that every year that we had that property. We just sold it in December, so we won't be doing the school supply drive at that property again. Yeah, creating a sense of community is such an important thing, especially when folks, and you know, this is their home. Yes. And you want them to stay around a longer period of time than, say, a typical tenant is maybe changes third, half turnover sometimes. And if you can get them to stay in your property a longer period of time, that uh is more profitability to you guys. So a sense of community, not only for being the right thing to do, but also too for profitability certainly does help. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the fun things that you guys have done or are going to do with some of the flexibility in your schedules that multifamily brings to you. Uh, We have an amazing trip planned this summer. We have rented a home in Park City and we're loading up kids and dogs and headed to the mountains to get out of the Texas heat for August. (laughs) The entire month of August. (laughs) Could you have done that in retail? Heck no. (laughs) (laughs) Doggone no. There's no way. Yeah. So it's that balance, right? We've got, because we've given a lot of people really good jobs Yeah. and we've delegated to them, set the expectation that we could manage this thing remotely, you know, for short periods. You know, we've gone to Spain for two weeks. We made money every day we were in Spain because we had staff out there earning their livelihood, taking care of everything for us. If there was one thing that you could look back and tell yourself 10 years ago, five years ago, four years ago, what would probably be the one thing that getting into multifamily has done for you? We were spoiled in Austin back in 2011, 12, when you could buy for 35,000 a door. And when it started creeping up 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 a door, we kind of got hung up on that rather than the return. And I wish we would have bought more. Yeah. Any funny stories in multifamily that you can think of since now you guys have done it for a long period of time, just anything that whether it's management or ownership or tenants or anything you can think of that's, that would, uh, would be funny. Well, I don't, funny, right? Because we're not resident facing where we are because we don't want credit at all. We want to make sure our staffs always get credit for all the fun stuff that we sponsor, right? Through our budget. But we, we just, we try to stay out of their hair, but it's always cool when you go onto a property and you see residents come in with their dogs and everybody in the office knows the dog by name. I've been on site before and uh, I was walking with one of the property managers and she went back into her office and I was kind of standing out in a, in a breezeway looking at my phone. Guy walked up to me, said, Hey, are, are you the owner? I'm like, Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am. He goes, man, thank you so much. I'm like for, for what? He goes, man, you're making this thing so pretty. You're, you're putting in flowers everywhere. You're so I don't know about funny stories, but you know, there's, that's the good stuff. When people notice what you're doing again, we don't want credit, but he kind of cornered me in a way that I kind of had to own up to who I was. And, you know, you like to know that you're making a, an actual difference in people's lives because what you said is huge. This is their home. It's a business for us. And our staff hears that all the time. Treat everybody with empathy and humanity. Treat them with respect because this is where they raise their children and cook their Thanksgiving dinner. Remember that. So that's the good stuff for me. We have one property in San Antonio where we've put out the colored rock and the residents absolutely love it. And the maintenance guys were talking about how they would go into the units and they'd have one one little rock up on their kitchen bar or whatever. And they're very proud of the rock. And so they've taken some of it into their homes. Yeah, it's actually that recycled <laughs> glass that's colored glass oh, that yeah. you'll see at some properties. Mm-hmm. We did it for the first time. It's really expensive, <laughs> but you do it sparingly and it's hugely impactful. But yeah, that was kind of cool that residents were actually taking it into their house because it was pretty. 
So this property that you guys just completed the acquisition on, and Hans, what, what, what do you think if you were to own a house that had a nice large lake next to it, on the other side had a golf course to it, what do you think you'd have to pay for something like that? Oh, in that location, probably three, four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, it's amazing. So I mean, you're talking about people's homes and, and you know living a great life with a pool that somebody else maintains and a lake that you can look out every morning or a golf course right down on the other side of the property. Boy, that you know that sounds great in my my mind, and uh, I'm sure your tenants are very happy that uh, now they have new owners with you guys. Any other words of wisdom before we we end here? For me, it's the big thing that everybody that's done what we've done kind of says, I'm going to echo it, that people ask me all the time, how do I get started? Get started. That's it. Get started. Figure out what you want to do and now go make it happen. Find other people that are doing what you're doing. Mirror them if you can. Shadow them if you can. Do a free internship if you have the ability in your in your life. Not everybody does, and I get that. But you got to plug yourself in, right? Don't be afraid to move. Because being afraid to move is going to keep you right where you are, right? I was working 110 hour weeks. I was miserable. I'm five foot nine. I was 240 pounds. That's not a life. So do something to make a better life for yourselves because it's definitely doable. Either investing in deals like we do or leading deals like we do. It's I'm a college dropout. Yeah, my wife is really smart, right? She she's got a uh, a master's, but you know, if a college dropout retail guy can do this. My God, just get out there and do it. Don't be afraid. Some great information. Somebody wanted to get to know you guys a little bit better. What's the best way for them to get in contact with you? The best way really is to go to our website. It's A as an Apple, P as in Paul, T as in Tom, dash guy. It's apartment guy, basically with a dash. Go to the website. You can see what we're up to. That's the best way to get in contact with us. Uh, I'm writing a book right now on the truth behind syndicating, how it all works and what the real story is, not what you hear on a stage. So that'll be out the second half of the year. Uh, so, you know, we'll keep you updated on the website and you can also follow me, the apartment guy on Instagram, apt.guy. That's the best way to kind of follow along. When are we going to see the apartment gal.com? <laughs> is that coming down the path? That's a very too? common question. Will you want to answer that stuff? Uh, you know, I'm the accountant. I'm a little quieter. <laughs> <laughs> So that was Bruce and Stephanie Peterson, the apartment guy out of Austin and now owns another property down in San Antonio. We appreciate you guys coming in and spending some time with us in the podcast. Hans, Box, thank you very much. Thanks for Thanks coming Thanks for in. having me on, Paul. Appreciate it. Again, uh, I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.